um, not familiar with how to do this. This is my first webinar in my entire life. Can you, is, can I, somebody know if I can hear, if anybody can hear me? If I can know that, oh, oh good, good. <laughs> All right. So um, when I was asked to inaugurate it, I was really, I felt honored. And when I heard Josh talk about me, I didn't know who he was talking about. So it seems I must have done those things if he says so, but I have no feeling. My basic desire has always been to give a lecture on a topic that I am not giving it here. And that is called everything you wanted to know about photosynthesis, but were afraid to ask. That would have been my topic, but I will not give that talk. So what I'm going to do is first tell you a few things about photosynthesis, why it is important, and why functional plant biology is in it, and also a few words about motivation. Where did I get my motivation? And then I will give my talk whenever I must to do so. Actually, my talk is already there. So if you get up in the morning, as we all do, we look up and see the sun. And when he pray, sun, consider sun as a sun god. And but it may be sun god to you and many people. But for me, it is really the most important thing because it allows the plants to take up CO2. It allows the plant to take water. Of course, water is already there and make oxygen. And so the plants do the process means they give off oxygen, which we know uh, is needed for our life. Without oxygen, there is no life. We need to respire. And then later, we make, plants make food for us, and without food, uh, with, without paratha, without roti, <laughs> without chawal, uh, whatever you eat, uh, you're not able to live. So it provides us food, provides us with energy, provides it, allows us to go on a car because all the energy ultimately is by photosynthesis the past, which was in the petroleum. And therefore, it is the most important thing. Now, our population is increasing like crazy. It is rising. And our food production is not there. We have many chemicals that are going to disappear. Therefore, it is essential. It is essential to work on photosynthesis. Now, who are the people who are going to solve the problem? It is very clear to me that the plant biologists or the botany people are providing the basic information about plants, but without the chemists, without the physicists, without the chemical engineers, without the computer scientists, without all those people from the College of Physics, from the College of Engineering, and College of Chemistry, there will be no solution. Why? Because plants are doing their best and we can improve them. And we have been trying to improve them uh, through various ways. Uh, there are groups in India, there are groups in China, there are groups everywhere, there are groups in Urbana, Illinois. Everybody is improving plants. But it is also clear that plants have a limit and therefore we need to do artificial photosynthesis. So in this case, it is very important. Now, I, I will give my talk whenever I'm asked, but I think I was asked to talk about motivation. And I would like to tell you that I, Josh already mentioned uh, that I was born in Allahabad. And it is very important for me to recognize how I was motivated. Uh, my school teacher, I don't even remember his name. I think it was called Merutra Saab, if I remember vaguely. He will grow plants outside, small plants, and we, we little kids would go there with him. And it was fascinating to see the plants grow. So there was simply the plants growing from a small to big making flowers. 
So that was my first excitement with this in school when I was in the fourth grade or fifth grade. And after that, there were many teachers and I would name them uh, science teacher. Uh, they really excited me to learn science. And after that, of course, as Rose Mentonman came to the University of Illinois Urbana, actually before that, when I was in MSC, one person who really was responsible, his name was Sri Ranjan. He, he had come from Cambridge and done a work with a man named Blackman. We know the Blackman reaction in photosynthesis, the photosynthesis made of light and dark reactions. So Sri Ranjan was one person who really uh, brought to life ideas, basic ideas in my MSc class. But when I reached Urbana, Illinois, then there was this Robert Emerson who was mentioned by Josh very well. Robert Emerson was really a wonderful person. He was a Quaker, Quaker or whatever you say, a peaceful man of peace. And, but he worked very hard and he tried, I would walk with him uh, being a little kid I guess I'm not a kid, really. Uh, walk home because my room was on way to his home. And he will tell me stories. And these things motivated me constantly because learning the stories of the past about who they worked with, what the problems were. So one story he would tell about his fight with his own professor, uh, Otto Warburg, the Nobel laureate, the then Nobel laureate. And it turns out that Emerson would get eight to 12 photons of light to make one oxygen, where his own professor Otto Warburg will get four photons of oxygen. And they, they would fight and Emerson would not agree. And then finally, uh, Warburg was invited to Urbana because he had trouble after the war. And when he came, uh, they, they made experiments with the same algal sample and Emerson get 12 and Warburg get four. This was amazing. Von Warburg always had an assistant to help him. Well, there is, there is, there is a story. Anyway, Warburg was wrong and Emerson was right. And that was story. He said, challenge anybody. So that's important to know. Challenge anybody. No, whether it be a professor, whether it be a Nobel laureate, any, just believe in yourself. That is one important thing. Believe in yourself and do the right things and be consistent and be curious. So these are some of the things, but when Emerson died in the plane crash on February 4, 1959, my wife Rajni and I were students and it was shock. It was shock, shattered all the experiments on the Emerson enhancement effect that was mentioned, proving the existence of two light reactions. Anyway, so when he died, Eugene Rabinovich put his hand on my shoulder and said, will you be my student? And I said, how come? You are a physicist, a physical chemist. I'm a botanist, plant biologist. How? He said, don't worry, you do what you are doing. So these are the things that I remember how they helped me. But afterwards, all my life is everybody else who, who did all the work. I was just a curious fellow working with. So I can, I can name hundreds of people. I can see that I went to Canada, I went to USA, I went to the Czech Republic, Russia, came to India, China, Italy, Iran. I didn't go to Iran, but the Iranian people, I mentioned his name, Najafur, uh, would simply work through the email. So I have been very fortunate. So my motivation has been my teachers and remembering the people who worked with me. I would like to inaugurate this and uh, have a simple statement says I inaugurate the three day International Webinar Doctrina 11, 2020 on Plant Functional Biology and at Sir Sayed College. And it is important because it is the COVID-19 time and this is the first official thing that I'm doing after three and a half months being here at GNU in one room sitting and waiting for it to go away. Thank you very much. Okay, well, all right. I'm very delighted that you have invited me to give this talk, something that I've never done before ever in my entire life. 
So it's International Conference on Plant Functional Biology. And I am Goginji Goginji now since last year. Uh, and I am speaking to the Department of Botany, Sir Sayed College. And I want to point out that you were 100 years later than our University of Illinois. So we were established in 1867 and your college established in 1967. So we are 100 years older. Okay, and you can see Sir Sayed's picture and the little picture of your place. Next slide, please. Next. Yes. All right, so now <laughs> uh, I have not learned Malayalam, but I have copied what they say, Valare Upakaram. I hope that's correctly pronounced. I know, <coughs> I know, Dhanivad, I know, Merci Boku. So I want to do Merci Boku and Dhanivad and Shukriya and Valare to all of you, to the principal sub, to Nafiza, to Rajo, to Jos. To, uh, I have to pronounce correctly the name, so I lifted it. Uh, Dr. Srija, Dr. Abu Salam, Dr. Gayatri, Mr. Nazil, and Shakira. Shakira has been very kind to send me an email. Okay, so after thanking all of you, I want to go next to the next slide, please. All right, so I have two quotations, and I think these two quotations are really very nice and interesting. And Dalal bin Muhammad Rumi said, let the beauty of what you love be what you do. Uh, my <laughs> thing is photosynthesis and I love it. Then there's the next one, it's from Mahayam, and who says there was a door to which I found no key. There was a veil to which I might not see. And this is also very nice for me because I see a lot of doors while doing photosynthesis and I don't find the keys. I still haven't found the keys to a lot of those doors. So basically, that's why I still continue to look for the keys of the doors. Next slide, please. So what are we talking about today? Well, photosynthesis 2020, past, present, and the future, but all mixed up in my talk. Why? Because today, we can't do what we do today without knowing what was yesterday. And when we know what was yesterday, we think of what is in the future. So without knowing the past, without being aware of the present, we cannot go in the future. So that's why I chose this title. What you see is my picture with the University of Illinois plaque, which I honored my professors, Robert Emerson and Eugene Rabinovich. Next slide, please. All right, so now I go back to a culture uh, near Sikkim, Bhutan, up there. And there was this particular word, past, present, and the future. Of course, they didn't have the word for the sentence. And there it says, do some kenta. This, I am not the knower of this, but someone else may be. Let us see where our thoughts lead to. So this is. Padma Sambhava has a knower of three times, past, present, and future. And I'm not that person. Therefore, my talk will not be quite as it may have been by Dusam Hindu. Said, said by Padma Sambhava. Next slide, please. All right, so let us get back to the nitty gritty of photosynthesis. So why are we interested in photosynthesis? Because it is a source of life. It gives us food, fuel, energy. And if we improve it, we will be better off because our population is growing up and up and up and the food supply is not. So it is necessary to understand what are the things that we can change or not change. So we need to see there's a light capture, sunlight is captured, and the energy is converted, and there's 50% loss. loss. Can we do something? Yes, a lot of people are trying to do something there. Then there's the biochemistry, and it's governed by the laws of physics, and there are 30 to 40% losses. 
And finally, there is energy accumulation and one to only one to four percent. This slide is taken from a review by Zhu, Zhengguan Zhu in China, who came to Urbana and is not with me, it's with Steve Long. So maximum efficiency for photosynthesis is 11% and solar energy, uh, for solar energy, but 30% for red light. So therefore, it is possible to improve photosynthesis. Next slide, please. And I leave out a lot of details. So I, I'm going to begin to focus on some people's research, uh, some of which I've been involved with before I go to the basics of photosynthesis. So the focus, first focus I told you about light utilization. I uh, say Dr. Khalil Shova has entered the waiting room for this meeting. Well, what should I say? Okay, so, so there are two things. Uh, you have what we call antenna, meaning thereby it's like a radio thing, meaning thereby is antenna is big pigment protein complexes that captures the light energy and that is the first thing that happens. And changing that antenna uh, has been done by Richard Serre and his research team. Uh, so there was a hypothesis, photon flux density, let's say is same and you put the antenna in a certain way and you make, make it two times higher and you reduce, there's chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B and you reduce chlorophyll B level to decrease the size of the antenna. So instead of increasing, you decrease the size of the antenna. So they, what they did, uh, as people with Sangeeta Negi and Perrin, they not, made knockdown constructs of chlorophyll A oxygenase to reduce chlorophyll B, not increase it. And you don't need to bother with the picture, it just shows where chlorophyll B at the top right, where chlorophyll B and chlorophyll A is. Next slide, please. All right. So this is the paper that they just published. It's called Light Regulation of Light Harvesting Antenna Size Substantially Enhances Photosynthetic Efficiency and biomass yield in green algae. The green algae being Chlamydomonas Reinhardia. And they have increased it by two-fold. It's a big, big swing. And as on the left is Sangeeta in this picture. On the right is the boss, uh, friend, Dick Sayre. And on the bottom is Jun Minagawa on the left. He's from Japan. He made very important contributions. And I'm doing nothing, enjoying life as usual, in retired life, sitting outside but I did participate. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so the model uh, is too much to explain uh, the model, but how do we optimize light harvesting antenna size on a daily basis? So they use a light regulated algal translational inhibitor, nucleic acid binding protein to inhibit what I just told you before, converting chlorophyll A to chlorophyll B through that oxygenase enzyme. And a lot of molecular biology, which I will not know how to talk about even. So next slide will show you some results, I hope. Next slide, please. All right, so they made mutants, a lot of mutants, as I mentioned now. And you can see now the top graph is their mutant called NC77. Then you have another one, and another one, NC7, and you have the parent wild type with the gray at the bottom. And you can see the rate of oxygen evolution in terms of micromole of oxygen per milligram chlorophyll per hour as a function of light. Uh, somebody's coming again. <laughs> I know the name here. Yeah, I can read the name, Kayatsi. Uh, okay, so you can see that how clear the effect is through this process. It's a big thing. I like it. Next slide, please. Okay, somebody else is coming. All right, <laughs> I, I, I see these things on my screen, so I can't see my whole screen. So I'll have to wait until, uh, okay, now I can see. So what I'm night plotting is the growth curve. 
and you can see uh, the dip, 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 depending on the light intensity, maybe you should just focus in the bottom curve, and you can see the NC77 mutant has the peak light intensity, biomass, biomass is very high, 0.35, let's say, in whatever units, grams per liter, and you can see the wild type is 0.15. So basically, we don't need to go too deep in this slide, but to believe me, that these are very high enhancement in biomass. Next slide, please. Okay, now, uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, I'd like to focus on the work that uh, we have done with two different groups and the second group here, one is in USA. This, I work with three groups, one in China, I will not talk about that, we we'll take too long now. So that's the other group is headed by Ashwani Parikh uh, of JNU and I tell you a few things about it. So he's asked a question, how do we feed more people without further damaging the planet? Of course, that's exactly the question that all of us have. The next slide, please. You can see uh, he is very nice guy, by the way. So they, they now, instead of algae, so there are two kinds of things. Algae, chlamydomonas, the green alga, and here, yeah, rice. We all like to have rice and wonderful rice. I'm sure in Kerala you have lots of rice, wonderful rice. So here are two varieties. Everybody knows in India, IR64, which is salt sensitive, and Pakali, which is salt tolerant. So what Ashwani's group has done, is see how you can improve the one with the help of the other. Next slide, please. All right, so they did all kinds of things, which of course I am uh, totally incapable of doing. Uh, his students and postdocs, there's forward genetics and there's reverse genetics. They from go, from, go from phenotype to gene or to mutation, and then you can go back so with all those technology and beautiful pictures that Ashwani kindly gave me the other day, uh, you can see, next slide, we show the results, hopefully. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so one of them we did in his lab uh, was a different way. There is something called rice intermediate filament rice intermediates. Now it was shown to stabilize photosynthetic machinery and yield under salinity and heat stress. So uh, the detailed experiments are not so important, but you can see the picture of the rice, how good it is, the ones that they made. And the bottom curve on the left, I just use shows you the technology, simple techniques we measure. We measure what we call photosystem two and photosystem one, and I'll give you history later uh, in the second talk, or the second part of my talk, I should say. So the chlorophyll A fluorescence goes up, what we call OJIP, an invention of mine with rate of Strasser, the nomenclature. And you can see that the IP rise is different in the wild type under salt stress than under control, so it goes down. However, the OEIF2, you can see there's no big difference. And so, and then the bottom curve shows looking at the photosystem. And I won't bore you with details of these experiments, but the point is the paper is there and it shows clearly, finally, that one, this OEF1 is better, better than the white type. Okay, next slide, please. Is that okay? All right, so they determine a lot of things that, as I said, I don't know how to do it. So they did heat maps that most of you understand. They did Venn diagrams and they're showing an increase and decrease. So the whole idea of this slide is simply that when they reprogram the metabolome and the transgenic plants, they can see what has changed and what has not changed. And that's about it as far as I'm concerned, but you can understand more by reading the paper. Next slide, please. All right, so then there's another uh, student, uh, Silas von Grandpa, we call him Graham. Uh, he, uh, when we went to Rajasthan, and in Rajasthan there are plants that are very salt tolerant. They live near the lake, which 
this salty lake. And then and they, we studied there and there's a gene there which can help the salt tolerant gene. But this plant is a multitasker plant. It lives there, it doesn't look very good, but it is very much living in this environment. So Graham and with many others co cooperation with also the Sne, who is Ashwani's wonderful wife, in the next door, next building in a, another institute. She had that group there, and Ashwani had the group at JNU. And so our paper is published, and we did this trying to find out how it is better than the others under diurnal rhythm and after transfer to continuous life. Next slide, please. So, so basically, you don't need to uh, look at the details, but only to say that this silly looking plant, uh, we look at chlorophyll A first and transient, and we look at the uh, photosynthesis and all parameters with time, and we found that it is it can is better in all the respects that we are looking for. Next slide. And now, of course, next slide, please. So I will now present in, in the next presentation, which is part two, uh, a bit of history, basics, and some more applications, because one of the applications is how we can use artificial photosynthesis to get back to better life. So please, uh, you can close this and open the other presentation and I shall wait. Okay. I begin, I begin with the person who really discovered what plants do. His name was Joseph Priestley, 1773-33 rather to 1804. He was a chemist, a natural philosopher, separatist theologian, innovative grammarian, multi-subject and a liberal political theorist. So this guy, we can see his picture on the left. It was in 1772, 72, he did, and I'm reading because I think this is the first discovery and this text was written by John Allen, a friend of mine in England. In 1772, Joseph Priestley described how oxygen is consumed by combustion or by respiration using a burning candle or a live mouse in a closed glass jar. His discovery predated the term oxygen, which was coined by Lavoisier. The results were reported in a paper entitled Observations on Different Kinds of Air. Uh, he wrote, I flatter myself that I have accidentally hit upon a method of restoring air which has been injured by the burning of candles and that I have discovered at least one of the restoratives, which nature employs for this purpose. It is vegetation. In what manner this process in nature operates to produce so remarkable an effect. I do not pretend to have discovered, but a number of facts declare in favor of this hypothesis. One might have imagined that since common air is necessary to vegetable as well as to animal life, both plants and animals had affected it in the same manner. And I own that I had that expectation when I first put a sprig of mint into a glass jar, standing inverted in a vessel of water. But when it had continued growing there for some months, I found that the air would neither extinguish a candle, nor was it all inconvenient to a mouse which I put into it. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, on the 17th of 70, 1771, I put a sprig of mint into a quantity of air in which a wax candle had burned out and found that on the 27th, that's only 10 days of the same month, another candle burned perfectly well in it. This experiment I repeated without least variation in the event, not less than eight or 10 times in the remainder of the summer. So he is the one who discovered that the plants make oxygen. Next slide, next slide. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, some parts is hidden, but that's okay. So now I want to remember for you the real discoverers of photosynthesis. This may be, you can call a school level lecture, but I think most of us, most scientists, forget the past, forget who the major discoverers were. So let us look at them. Let us, Jan Ningenhoof, a Dutchman, 
he discovered that light was needed for photosynthesis. Why? Because he first was growing plants upstairs, and then one day he decided to take this plant downstairs where it was dark. He didn't know the light was needed, and the plant didn't live. So, oh, light is needed for, for the life. So that was the first. Joseph Priestley, I already told you about. Uh, he was British, English. Jean Senevier, a Swiss, on the right, at the top right. And he discovered that CO2 was needed for photosynthesis. And Nicolas de Saussure, also a Swiss, uh, you can see uh, what he did. Water was needed for photosynthesis. And finally, Julius Robert von Meyer, a German, uh, he discovered that light energy is converted into chemical energy, lots of thermodynamics. So next slide, please. I can see Rajagopal. All right, my part of the slide is still hidden. I don't know if I can move it. Can you move it somehow or not? Uh, but it's okay. All right, so let us, let us then see how does it take place? How does the process take place? Well, I, I chose the most complicated slide uh, to show you that cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, as we used to call them, uh, have both respiration and photosynthesis essentially close by. And that's the most complex of the system. You have two photosystems on the very left. You can see photosystem two with the red big arrow going in there. You cannot see me, right? Uh, I cannot show you, I guess. So the photosystem two is there on the very left. And uh, if you go and start counting from one, two, three, four, five, six, the sixth green one is photosystem one, and the extreme right is ATP synthase. So let's focus on these, and the middle is cytochrome B6 complex, is sort of light greenish. So there are other complexes which are in the respiration um, needed, and cyanobacteria, we shall skip them. I just wanted to be sure that you recognize that cyanobacteria are more complex. And what is wrong in the slide for cyanobacteria? Cyanobacteria have many times more photosystem one than two, but that's okay for this slide. Now, who are the people at the top? There's one guy sitting, you can see him with his head, uh, bald head, and another guy leaning <laughs> and looking at him. The guy who's leaning and looking at him with a tie is Govinji, and the guy who's sitting very, very serious is Andy Benson. He is a discoverer of how carbon is fixed. And we have written five papers, they're all on my website. And we call it Calvin Benson cycle, not Calvin cycle, because Benson's discoveries were key and actually the first paper was by him alone. All right, so, so how does the photosynthesis take place? Light comes in photosystem two, and all the things at the top you see on the very left, uh, blue is a phycocyanin and all that kind of things. We don't want to belabor those, but electrons flow from photosystem two. Water is oxidized to oxygen and then electrons go through all the system, uh, ultimately making at the top, reducing power from NAD goes to NADPH. You can see the yellow, uh, the blue uh, color. And then you can see that as electrons move, Protons move uh, from the outside of the membrane, from the cytosol area to the lumen side. And these protons then go through the ATP synthase and convert ADP and PI into ATP, which is then needed just like an ADPS to make the Calvin Benson cycle and give us food. Next slide, please. All right, so the first process. The first process is clearly it's like an antenna. They have an antenna, meaning thereby plants and algae and cyanobacteria are capturing light with an antenna. The word antenna was coined only in 1965 by my good friend Rod Clayton at Cornell. And so there is antenna and there is reaction center. So there is excitation energy transfer from one pigment complex to the other and finally to the reaction center where the charge separation takes place. So light energy is converted into chemical energy simply by converting the light energy 
into charge separated pigments. Okay, next slide. I see a lot of things. Somebody else is coming in. All right, now next, this slide. Uh, you don't have to look at the slide. It is just given here. It is a slide taken from Bob Blankenship, who has written a wonderful book called Molecular Mechanism of Photosynthesis to show that there is an extreme diversity of antenna system and, and suggests a multiple independent evolutionary origin. And I don't want to belabor more details, but to show that we have to learn this in order to see, because I told you in the very beginning that we can change the antenna and changing the antenna can make better photosynthesis and more biomass. So we have to therefore understand the antenna. Next slide, please. All right. It says your internet connection is unstable. Is it okay, Radni? Is it working? Okay. All right. So uh, I, I don't want to give you the details, but the point is that we now know the details. This particular slide is made by John Neal in England. And what he did is an old slide. What he did is to put all the components in the various four complexes that are key to the process. Why do we want to understand that? In order to understand that, we the reason we need to understand is to ask the question, where can we manipulate? And we just talked about only the antenna. And so this to show where is the slow reaction? What is the slowest reaction? So we know now the rates of every single reaction, which is in the Z scheme of the. All right. So the photosystem two on the left, very left. We know that things are happening in microseconds, all the way up to one millisecond only. The slowest reaction is a water oxidation step, the enzymatic step. And every other step is faster. So unless you change the slowest step, you're not going to get the overall reaction better. So can we do something? Well, the artificial photosynthesis people are looking at that. So they say, okay, these na natural things were bad. They're so slow. So they are making artificial systems in which they will make that system faster. All right, so the artificial people, the chemists are learning from it. Now, in the process, from photosystem two, electrons and protons, electrons from photosystem two, protons from outside, you can see that. You see, I can point out fingers. So uh, if I had a real presentation where I could show that, I can talk more, much, much better. Anyway, so it becomes plastoquinol, and that is the oxidation. The plastoquinol is 20 milliseconds. So, People say, ah, we should change that, make it faster. All attempts so far have failed. And therefore, the artificial photosynthesis people are coming and say, hey, you guys, <laughs> natural photosynthesis people, no good. We will make it better. So they, they are, artificial photosynthesis people are working on faster electrons. All right. So after that, then the uh, things are reduced. Plastocyanin, a copper protein, PC, as it's written in the middle and on the right, uh, on the photosystem one, and on the cytochrome B6F complex region, it then moves physically to photosystem one. All right, and then, so is there any bottleneck reaction? Actually, in photosystem one, we cannot really see any reaction that is slower than what we just talked about. Okay, all right. Then ATP synthase, okay, now oh, there are slow reactions in the top, in the rubisco, which is the bad guy. And so a lot of attempts are being made to see what you can do to maneuver that. And that is Urbana, Illinois, Don Ort, and many other groups are trying to find alternate ways to run the system. Next slide, please. Okay. All right, let's give you a little bit of other history. So we all know about two light reactions and two photosystems. Who were the guys who really started the idea? 
if you look at, if you were a student of Eugene Rabinovich, you would have read his 1945 book uh, from <laughs> page one to the end, page 300, whatever. And you see in the middle a picture. On the very left corner within the brown box, you can see on the right is 4H2O and then 4H2O bars. And then on the left side, say 4CO2. And in the middle, you can see one called 4H nu and another 4H nu. So the idea that there are two light reactions must be used was based on the concept of thermodynamics, not on any experiment. And it originated in the mind of James Frank, the Nobel laureate, in 1941. And Rabinovich, being his student, uh, picked it up and wrote it beautifully. Then, from 1945 to 1960, there was a big jump. And Emerson came in and showed that there must be two photosystems. And Robin Hill, the English biochemist, was standing in the middle picture with Giorgio Forti of Italy, uh, uh, gave the picture, which is known as the Hill and Bendel scheme on the right, 1960, showing that one light reaction takes electrons, here he put in the top water, takes the electrons from water to something else, and then from something else, another light reaction takes electrons from there to excess, which is an NDP. So the concept was there, but the concept was already there in Urbana, Illinois before the Hill and Bendel scheme and was every day written on the blackboard, but never published. So in this article that I wrote, uh, you can read the history on the left in the top. You see Rabinovich reading a Swedish newspaper with me and my wife, Rajni, and we were having fun in 1961 uh, talking about these things. Next slide, please. All right, so now there is a Z scheme. Let's see, I don't know whether, any, oops, sorry. I, I think that's, it's not good. I, I was trying to get up, but that should not. All right, so the Z scheme, uh, you, can, you can download the poster from my website. The Z scheme is simply because it looks like a Z in England, a Z in America, a Z scheme, a Z scheme. And so the photosystem two and one is there. And all the electron transfer chain with every single time scale I have put, or rather I should say we have put uh, on there. And that's what I talked about, where the bottleneck on the top you see is one to four millisecond, in the middle where it says PQ is one to 20 millisecond, and so on. And so what am I saying about history? Well, the first of all, Emerson's experiment showed that one reaction is run by chlorophyll A, and he said the other is run by chlorophyll B. Was he right? And that's my PhD thesis. And when I did the experiment, I found, we, I now had to submit my thesis under Eugene Rabinovich, because Emerson died in a plane crash, and I saw, ah, if, if you see my picture in the bottom, you, at the top you see the chlorophyll B, that's the Emerson man. But on the right, you see another band, chlorophyll A670, I wrote. Emerson had missed that band. And therefore, he thought one reaction is on my chlorophyll B. I went to the diatom on the top right, and there were clearly there's no chlorophyll B. You only see a chlorophyll A band, chlorophyll A670. So next slide, please. So, now, so I, I recall for you, my experiments from 1960. <laughs> now, who is the person who really proved? That I can hear other people uh, at the same time I'm speaking. So, all right. So, Doisens, Lou Doisens of the Netherlands, and his student Yana Mez in 1961 did the really key experiment. They put light, what they call light one, going for the system one. And what they found that the cytochrome F was oxidized, means it lost an electron. When they put on the top another light uh, going in the photosystem two, that same cytochrome was reduced. Therefore, it was a series of schema photosynthesis 
And that paper of Doys and Summers is the key historical paper proving it. Well, then the question became very quickly is, well, what is a primary photochemistry? I told you that is a charge separation, how to measure it. So I became interested in it. And one of my students, James Fenton in my, in my lab and Mike Vasilewski in Argonne, and we did some of the early experiments measuring how much time it takes for the first reaction and it was found to be picosecond. Now there are hundreds of papers in that field. Then we discovered something that Otto Warburg had discovered, that bicarbonate CO2, instead of only being fixed, used for carbohydrate, is necessary for electron flow. And we discovered in our lab that would been QA, the molecule, and QB, the ground photosynthesis. I don't want to belabor that, so I go on to the next slide. Next slide. All right, so this is a very difficult slide, very detailed slide, but this kind of summarizes what is going on. So let us on the left bottom, you see what I've written, big letter, oxygen clock. There are four steps. And why do we want to learn that? If we want to learn, because we want to ask the question, can be manipulated and artificial, and the chemists will ask the question, what they can learn, that's why. So there is a clock. The period for clock was discovered Pierre Joliot by Pierre Joliot, grandson of Maria P. Curie and Pierre Curie, and Bessel Koch of the Netherlands who discovered the reaction center of force. So they are discoverers of the oxygen clock, and it is the manganese clock. And then the electrons are going from the water side through this clock to the top side where quinones is being reduced, and was discovered again now by, in the Netherlands by Jana Mez and his student Bruno Velsus, Velsus, can pronounce the Dutch name properly. And they discovered there's a two electron gate there. Here is a period for clock and the two electron gate means electrons come once, it's reduced, but sit there. Nothing will move until another electron comes and the molecule called QB, which is the plastic one, when it's doubly reduced, only then it can move forward. And this is where the bicarbonate that I talked about, which was a discovery of Otto Barber, but not here, because he thought that meant oxygen comes from CO2 and he was wrong. Anyway, so that was this area, photosystem two area. And on the right side is the ATP synthesis. And there are Nobel prizes, none on the photosystem two. Uh, the Nobel prize ATP synthesis, Paul Boyer of uh, USA, uh, California, and John Walker of England, to how the protons when go through, ro allow the rotation of molecules and the rotational energy is converted. Now, we already mentioned Andy Benson, and you can see then the CO2 is fixed by a, also by a clock or a cycle, and we want to call it Benson-Calvin cycle. Uh, and then there's another what we call C4 photosynthesis, so I put the name Hatch and Slack there. So this is a kind of basic concept of the whole photosynthesis. This uh, poster, now without the details, is also on my website, this middle poster. Next slide, please. All right, so now there is a, we talked about, reg, we talked about antenna. So there are two antennas, one, in photosystem two and one photosystem one. They both have to be equal in order for a efficient electron flow. So this is another bottleneck problem. This is where somebody can come in and perhaps help. So something happens and was called a state change, a mechanism to balance absorption in the two photosystems. Rajagopalji is there. He knows yeah, yeah. this. I'm so, here. All right. I may not show your slide. We shall see if it's there or not. So there's a state two to state one change. A low chlorophyll A fluorescence goes to high chlorophyll A fluorescence. It happens when you shine light one, means photosystem one light. And state one to state two change comes high chlorophyll fluorescence to low by exposure to light. So we, you can use this chlorophyll A fluorescence technology, which we proved in, uh, with George Papa Giorgio in Czech Republic that this really method works. So, Next slide. So that's the mechanism. 
Okay. All right. All right. Just show you the pictures who are the discoverers of this state change. On the top is my friend Norio Murata of Japan. And independently, Jack Myers, another friend who passed away, older than me, very friendly, and his former associate, Celia Bonaventura, who is here in the USA, there in USA right now, and showed these are their papers uh, proving the existence of state changes. And on the bottom, my first PhD student, George Papa Giorgio, sitting with Norio Murata, I took this picture in Japan. But we missed it. We actually had discovered it. Next slide. Prasanna Mohanty, one of my students at Rajagopal knows. Uh, next slide, please. So I show Prasanna. You see, and the, there are three pictures. And the bottom picture is Prasanna Mohanty standing. Next to him is Vaishnav Tripathi. And on the top is Mohanty with somebody, Biswal. Uh, and on the left, Papa Jarju and so on. Anyway, so Mohanty had discovered already long, long ago, <laughs> before the Murata and Bonabunta, that there's some silly thing going on. But these results were published later because we did not understand it. Uh, and I don't want to deal with it uh, now, but just to tell you that it's nice to admit that you missed something in life. That's good. So we missed it. That's right. Next slide, please. All right, so this is, oh, this is, this is, ah, Rajagopal knows this. Uh, so I went there and Sirisha Kodru, uh, with Sirisha, we made experiments on chlorophyllae fluorescence and said, to how can you tell uh, state change? So we had a mutant from Conrad Millennial, right? Or no, no, we got it from Jean David Roche. This is a Roche mutant. And STT7, which had no state change. And you can see, the graph B and the graph A in both cases. Then let's see, look at the graph B on the right, that there is a fluorescence change, which we call S to M, a term coined by George Papa George and I, uh, shows that that is going up, but in the mutant, which has no state change. So you can use this tool to see the <coughs> phenomenon of state change. Okay, next slide, please. Well, now I have a trouble, oh, I think I, it's okay. So I'm not going to uh, go too much into, into this, but just to point out that if we want to increase photosynthesis, we got to know where is what going. It's in my earlier slide, how many gigatons of carbon is coming and how much is going where and so on. So, so I won't deal with it directly. I go to the next slide, please. Something is stuck. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. Hello? Yeah? It's not moving. Okay, sir. Please wait. Okay. Ah, okay. okay. So now, so this is a slide from my good friend Don Orth saying, what can we do? So, the meet the demand. 2017, we have to double the cultivation. And so you can see the orange line and the green. The green is the current gigatons of carbon being made by current cultivation. We need to double it. Okay, next slide, please. The other things are remain, forests are remaining. So now uh, let us look at some of the plants that are, by the way, I'm sorry. Uh, this was glitch in the slide. All right, so the maize has been increasing. Our same, it's taken from a paper by Steve Long and Donor. But the rice has been going down. Wheat has been going down. So therefore, it is necessary for us to work on rice and wheat. Next slide, please. Next slide. So how do we find out what is the problem? 
So the eel pun, and this is again taken from, given by my good friend Donner, that there is solar energy, you're not going to change that. There's the interception efficiency. We, we can do something with that, definitely. Not too much, but still, as we show from the experiments of Kamida Monus and some experiments going in a higher plan. But the biggest thing is the conversion efficiency and, of course, the partitioning efficiency. So improving photosynthesis conversion is quite crucial besides interception, which is also important. Next slide, please. All right, so how efficient is photosynthesis? I uh, just kind of repeat. I have a picture of my friend Jing Wang Zhu uh, in uh, Shanghai. I go there very often, just like I come here to India. So 50% outside active spectrum, 5% reflected. You can't do anything unless you change the plants. 15% is inefficiency, can't do much. 10% carbonate biosynthesis. 10% photorespiration. Ah, ah. That is somewhere some groups are working on respiration. Then the C3 potential, you can perhaps make like C4 plant, which is better potential. So basically there is a lot of hope in this part also. Next slide, please. All right, so has anybody succeeded? Well, by increasing CO2, yes. There have been experiments on cassava, soybeans, rice, and wheat. Increasing CO2 is expensive, but you can increase it in field. Next slide, please. These are quick slides, some of them. So ah, this is what I was talking about. So photorespiration, the enzyme Rubisco, a lot of work in Urbana, Illinois by William Ogren, Archie Portis, and so on and so forth. It is Robisco is a bad enzyme, it also reacts with oxygen. So what the arts group did is, okay, let's go some alternate ways of life and work on alternate oxidation systems and see if we can do it. Next slide. I don't know how much time I'm taking. So they did field trial, they have an alternate pathway. So they changed the things. I won't tell you how to read the paper. And they did field trials and they show, show that alternate pathways really had an increase. The person difference in biomass compared to non-modified ones was quite good. Alternate pathways, leaf was high, leaf amount of leaf was high, stem was high, the total was high. So this, this paper was published in Science. Next slide, please. And of course, you can look at the plant. And you can see yourself that they look, they did the tobacco. Of course, they have to do with other things. Next slide, please. It's just to show you they're better. So there are, there's a project. I'm not involved in any of this project, but they, uh, as they say, accept the fact that you can use algal mechanism. You can lower photorespiration, I just talked about. You can improve Rubisco. A lot of people worked on it, not much yet accelerate RUP generation, increase mesophyll conduct, all kinds of things that you can do. But that's okay. I'm not expert on this. Okay, next slide, please. So now the artificial. So as I told you before, while I started my talk, I just started telling you the people in chemistry says bioengineers, bio biochemists, chemical engineers, all sorts of people. And this paper is published in Nature Materials by Virgil Andre, Bartron Ruela, and Erwin Reisner from England. And they said, bias free solar syn gas I will produce by integrating a molecular cobalt catalyst with perovskite, the name of the Russian perovsky, and bismuth vanadate tannin. So totally artificial. So I don't want to tell you how good or bad it is, but it is a good direction uh, and alternate way. Next slide, please. Now, another group, Andre et al. say they put all these things together. It's like a, you know, an engineering feat. It's like a, a box you're making in the lab. And 
producing all those things that I talked about. And uh, anyway, these are details that we don't need to know. They produce photocurrent. Next slide, please. All right, so now another group in Urbana, Illinois, headed by Dr. Jain, Professor Jain, published in Nature Communication, uh, 2019, and they went totally also artificial, and they made CO2 reduction and ionic liquid medium. And again, I can't describe the details in a quick way, and also I don't understand a lot of the details. But the point is that they were able to do in artificially CO2 reduction. Next slide, please. I'm coming to the end, I hope. Somebody hope will edit my talk and cut the extra useless things. I wait. All right, the future must focus. I'm, I'm ending. The future must focus on improving natural photosynthesis, as I suggested, as is being done in many countries, in many laboratories, including India, China, USA, and Europe. And I've not, not named their work, I've read their work, as well as exploiting artificial photosynthesis. Next slide. I'm trying to end my picture with my picture. I honor all the leaves of the world, as well as all the algae. I thank you for your kind invitation. I think it, maybe there's one more slide to make you feel good or bad, I don't know. Is there a slide? I think there is. All right, that is the last slide. And I say, as the sun sets, photosynthesis also sets, and I definitely try to sleep while the sun is down. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Goenji. Thank you. Thanks a lot.